Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, on this momentous occasion of celebrating the 50th anniversary of our work in cultural landscapes, this presentation argues that the recognition and development of cultural landscapes as valued heritage has been an important influence on the evolution of both broadened values of heritage and conservation approaches included in international doctrine. Um, as we all know, the 1931 Athens Charter and 1964 Venice Charter are generally considered the philosophical foundations of modern heritage conservation. And although there's been continued debate about their intent, the effectiveness, the interpretation of those charters, along with many, many others before the 1972 World Heritage Convention, it is uh, generally understood when we look a little deeper that the terminology, the language, the values in those documents evolved from setting, they really looked a lot at landscape aesthetics and beauty. But the thing that I find most interesting is that even from the earliest of charters, they really understood destruction to human made and natural places all over the world and how to try and address those as evolving issues. So examination of the 1972 and uh, World Heritage Convention, the 1979 Bird Charter, the 1982 Florence Charter, 1992 cultural landscapes being recognized in the World Heritage Operational Guidelines, the 1994 NARA document and the 2011 um, Hull document all uh, demonstrate that the emergence of the cultural landscape thinking, assessment, and conservation practices have influenced contemporary heritage doctrine to move beyond early preservation philosophy. So with the recognition uh, 1972, obviously a, a hugely important document that had a, was a major milestone with literally decades of work by multiple international conservation organizations. It was a landmark for many reasons. Um, for cultural landscape purposes, it was the first international instrument to address both cultural and natural heritage. Um, However, as we all know, when it looked at natural and cultural values, um, even though they were physically in the same location, they were definitely viewed as a parallel effort rather than a cohesive interdependent culture nature concept. And so the interesting thing about the World Heritage Convention is um, many of the conventions or charters that we look at, we do have to go back to them and review them and critique them and analyze what works and what does not work. And with the Heritage Convention, obviously it took 20 years, but to create a truly an action guidance document, operationalizing, um, but you have to gradually incorporate that interrelationship of culture and nature. So I have to say right up front, I love this charter. It's like my most favorite charter of all time. It is so visionary and so revolutionary, and it really forwarded a lot of our contemporary baseline thinking about heritage conservation, as well as compelling the dialogue further. And with the key things in the Burr Charter that uh, you can see cultural landscape coming directly through, whether we use the term in any of these charters or not, is this idea of significance being embodied in place, that it's everything. It's the fabric, the people, the use, the setting, the meanings, the records, et cetera, and that all aspects of those significance should not put any one value at the expense of other values. So really the baseline of the kind of conversations we're having today are absolutely what's happening back in the Borough Charter. But the other thing that's happening, um, and you can see it beginning with the World Heritage Convention, is this idea of practical guidance. The image on the right-hand side shows you the initial thoughts of how do you understand significance? How do you develop policy? How do you manage in accordance with policy? So an incredibly important document for thinking about uh, cultural landscape influencing uh, international uh, charters. The interesting thing about the Florence Charter as well is this idea of going back, back to earlier charters, seeing what does or doesn't work. So in 1978, there was a review of the Venice Charter by different groups. And it was decided that it needed supplements, that it wasn't adequate the way it was, and that other chapters and, and topics needed to be addressed among them, this group about historic gardens. So as we all have stated several times today already about the document equating historic garden to a living monument, but it also talked about scale, began to talk about scale, small or large. It also began to talk about managing dynamic processes. So again, a very important um, charter 
that has showed how cultural landscape has been going through many different um, doctrines. We're all aware of the importance of 1992 regarding cultural landscapes. So for 20 years, numerous people, working groups, organizations with different perspectives, basically made a practical directive about how we should be implementing the World Heritage Convention. So we are recognized, and although we have definitions there, really what's happening is that we're emphasizing the interaction of people with their environment over time. And that those, diver those values are definitely in natural values, cultural values, and that it's broadening the definition of heritage and then began to reshape what was happening in conservation practice. Within a couple short years, uh, also with the World Heritage Convention, the really important point um, in the involved and associated categories of cultural landscape is recognizing both tangible and intangible heritage and the integral role of local communities and indigenous peoples. Um, in 1984, have 1994, they have a customary law and traditional management, but it was about stewardship. It was about involving local indigenous communities. With NARA, again, reinforcing dynamic processes, tangible, intangible, passed down knowledge through time. And then as we get into uh, 2011 in Hull, it really has to do with integrating urban and heritage values. It's about people. The more important thing is about toolkits and what's being used there. I'm gonna turn it over to Nora now, who's gonna help us think into the future. Great, thanks, uh, Carrie, and hello to all. Um, as Carrie described over the last uh, 50 years, it really was the recognition of cultural landscapes that provided a catalyst for a lot of the change in these international doctrines. Um, the next slide um, shows that um, while there has been, as we've discussed, lots of progress in uh, definitions of cultural landscapes and some management advice, um, there's still the sense that this um, is, needs some additional work and, and people are starting to turn, and we've heard that through this symposium, how to be more effective, how to be more sustainable, and how to be more equitable. And um, those began to, you start seeing themes emerging about people-based interdisciplinary approaches are needed. The next slide really looks at some of the challenges and some of the um, topics that, um, uh, focus uh, comes out of that review to focus on these as one way forward. And importantly, the, um, the next slide um, shows that it's really these our working groups and I'm turning now the, the mirror on our uh, forum. I can't think of a better demonstration of how important this forum is for these kinds of deliberations than to hear the conversations yesterday and today, even on the fundamental definitions of cultural landscapes. Um, so I, um, we've, long, we've uh, looked back and uh, see the accomplishments, but we also realize the challenges um, and the importance and complexity of this work. So um, in looking ahead, we want to celebrate the, um, uh, the progress and uh, keep working on uh, the challenges. So thank you all and look forward to working with you on this. <laughs>